welcome back. Now the first week we done the regimental mascot. Last week we done the Victoria Crosses. Now this week I'm just going to give you a quick insight into some things to do with the Zulu campaign. It's just to let you know so when you come to the museum that you won't be able to ask and you'll be able to look at things and see what I'm talking about. Now the first thing is the question I always ask is why were the courts red? Because in the Zulu War and in the Boer War you could be seen as far away as 14 and a half miles and as you can see they are bright red. A lot of questions are answered by saying to hide the blood. The true answer to this question I will tell you now. It is the cheapest dye on the market and it was a lot cheaper for the regiments to buy red coats and put on facing colours than buying full coats in regimental colours. It's cochineal, which is beetle blood, or food colouring. So if anybody asks you in the future, why are the coats red? I hope you don't say because of the blood, but the real reason. Interesting thing is the Zulu War, January the 22nd, 1879. High summer. The troops were marching and the uniforms they had were a thick red material. Inside it's got a, a thick coat in. You weren't allowed to have the buttons open because that wasn't regimental. And if you can imagine walking in 35, 40 degrees, when they made the film Zulu and Zulu Dawn, because again the temperature was very high, the actors used these ones and they made of cotton very thin they didn't sweat so much but if they wanted to do the film justice they should have worn the original ones and told us exactly how they felt so this is a cotton one uh, not very good it done the part now the other things that you got is the equipment that the Zulus used. This is a Zulu shield. It's a war shield and this is, don't correct me on the right words because I can't speak Zulu, but basically it's Nimabotho, which is a virgin soldier's shield. They went into battle and as they fought and they come back, because you couldn't get married until you killed an enemy in battle, wore an item of the clothing, cut them from below the chin to the pelvis to release the spirit, and at that point you could get married. There'd be a lot of single blokes in my regiment if they had to do that today, but saying that, when they come back and they were authorised, the shield would be bleached, and the more white that it got, the more experienced you were. Couldn't stop a bullet. I'd probably say it wouldn't stop a bayonet. But against another spear thrown, it would do his job. Very brave men, especially coming at an Henry Martini or Martini Henry with just this in front. Other pieces of kit that they had were spears. And when you see a cowboy film and they turn around and say, what Indians were you? And they pick up an arrow and they look at the arrow and they say, oh, Cheyenne, because of the shape. They could do exactly the same with these. As you can see, the heads of the spears are different shapes. Different shapes, different regiments or impies. So, that's another way of telling a Zulu. 
Mind you, we were dressed in red and they were in loincloths, so that was a better way of telling the Zulus. And the last piece of kit they had was a nopkari, war club. Basically, it's a piece of vegetation that's cleaned, greased up, preserved, and they have it as long as they want. It doesn't matter if it's six foot long or 12 inches long, it's still called a nopkari. Now, that's what the Zulus had when they attacked at Lisandrwana and Rourke's Drift. The poor, poor British soldier only had Martini Henry 577 450 top loader Mark II. Maximum range 1,300 uh, 1, yards. Rate of fire between 5 and 11 rounds per minute, depending on the experience of the soldier behind it. Now, there's two ways of doing it, like everything in the army. There's the official way and the unofficial way. The official way is holding the weapon, dipping down, thumb in top, pull down, recess opens, you put a round in, close it, up, lean in, fire. The other way of doing it is when you've got the experience is by using your little finger. You put your little finger in, so you initially load, little finger in the back, you fetch it up, you fire, when you fetch it down, you cock it, thumb round down, by the time you fetch the rifle into this position, you can put another round in, which saves seconds. The tear on the side, this is the only safety mechanism on this weapon. At 12 o'clock, it is unloaded. When you load it, it goes to 11 o'clock, and that tells you if the weapon is live or not. The other part of the weapon is the bayonet. I'm six foot, bigger than me. The average height of a British soldier in Victorian times, was five foot four to five foot seven, 32 inch chest, 28 inch waist, and weighed about eight stone. Anybody from the RW would remember Skeggy? If you got him soaking wet, that would be about the weight of a soldier in the Victorian times. Matter of fact, it was up until the First World War, they were still the same. A Zulu could be up to six foot nine because they were a part of the Maasai Mara tribe and they could cover 50 yards or 50 miles in a day and put a fight in. It took us 10 days to walk nine miles. I'm not saying no more of that, but those in the MT, please take note. These are the weapons that were used by the regiment. As you can see in the background, we got a, a tidy display of the equipment that was used. The interesting thing is this little chair. This chair was recovered from the hospital at Rokes Drift. And it was one of the only ones that survived. I wouldn't trust it to take my weight. So please, when you come up, don't muck about with them. Just look at them, don't move them. These are precious to the regiment. You can see the dress that was used by the infantry at that time. It's quite warm. I've just run up Penny Van and run down because I had to do a talk to you. I haven't had time to change and I'm sweating. And if you believe that, you believe that I was in the Welsh Regiment, which I was. I'm pretty fit. I'm now going to go on to another section. Be with you in a second. I was saying earlier on about the message sent from Pauline. The blue one is the message. This is it 
the final message from Isla Luana sent out to Chelmsford. And it says, Staff Officer, report just came in that the Zulus are advancing in force from left front of camp, signed HM Pauline, Lieutenant Colonel, 8 5 a.m. Received 9.30, 22nd of the 1st, 79 HP. One hour, 25 minutes for the message to get there. This is one of the most important messages we got and the reasons being we know from this what time the Zulus attacked the camp and what time Chelmsford received the message. He was 16 kilometres away from the action. Another piece of interest in is this letter from Griffiths, Griffith, uh, from Cledic, near Swansea, and he wrote home a couple of months after the engagement, and that tells you all about it. That is first hand experience of a soldier that was there. So if you come to the museum, you can read it, because if I read it out to you, you won't come to the museum. So I'm not going to. But it's there for you to see. We're not, I'm not going to do it anymore on the museum at the moment. We're going to come back in a couple of weeks and do something else. But this is just a refresher to remember, one, for anybody that served in the regiment, the museum's here, it still holds the history, and the more you support it, the safer the museum is. For visitors that have seen the film, come and get the facts. Come and learn what really happened at the Rokes Drift and Isandwana. Come and see the artefacts that were actually taken from the battlefield and used. This is the Regimental Museum of the Royal Welsh. I have only dealt with the stuff from the RW and South West Borders. I don't apologise for that because they were my regiments. But next time we will deal with other regiments within our brigade.